Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Daniel. And this is lesson number four in that series for January 25 of 2020, entitled From Furnace to Palace. See if you can guess what that's all about. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, we know that these records have come from so long ago that they record stories and places and events that seem in some respects really crazy and bizarre to us. But let us now extract from it the truth which you want us to know is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So why do you think the king constructed that golden image? And when do you think that story took place? Now, you know, you would probably most Adventists at least would say, well, that's obviously in the days of Daniel. But we have some other information that might add some color to the story. Zedekiah, the ruler, the king of Judea, was summoned to Babylon, according to Jeremiah 51, 59, in 594 BC. That was just about in the middle of his reign as king. It is most likely that it was in connection with the de dedication of that golden statue. What do you think the statue looked like? Was it a statue of Nebuchadnezzar himself? Was Nebuchadnezzar seeking to establish a new form of worship? What was the ultimate conclusion to this whole story? So we just get a little bit of a summary. Jackie? Thus these youth, imbued with the Holy Spirit, declare to the whole nation their faith, that he whom they worshiped is the only true and living God. This demonstration of their own faith was the most eloquent presentation of their principles. In order to impress idolaters with the power and greatness of the living God, his servants must reveal their own reverence for God. They must make it manifest that he is the only object of their honor and worship, and that no consideration, not even the preservation of life itself, can induce them to make the least concession to idolatry. These lessons have a direct and vital bearing upon our experience in these last days. And that's Ellen White in Heavenly Places. That's a very intriguing sentence, that last one. These lessons have a direct and vital bearing upon our experience in these last days? Hmm. Do you believe that part of the conflict at the end of time will be over worship? I know someone who believes absolutely that it will be. Will it be a question of how we worship, or who we worship, or why, or all of the above? All of the, well, all of the above. Yes, probably. Today, does it seem almost impossible that the question of worship could take center stage in our humanistic world? Under communism, for example, which is occupying a great percentage of the world still, Parents faced a problem at times, either send their children to the government schools on Sabbath or have them removed from their home and placed elsewhere. What would you have done? Well, I know people who have faced that situation, mm -hmm. and some of them did go to school on Sabbath, and some didn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a tough one. Well, look at these verses. Daniel 3, we're going to start out with the first seven verses. King Nebuchadnezzar had a gold statue made, 27 meters high, that's uh, <coughs> 60 meters, and nearly 3 meters wide, that's 6 meters, I'm sorry, 6 um, cubits. And he had it set up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then the king gave orders for all his officials to come together, the princes, governors, lieutenant governors, commissioners, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other officials of the provinces, they were to attend the dedication of the statue which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. When all these officials gathered for the dedication and stood in front of the statue, a herald announced in a loud voice, people of all nations, races, and languages, you will hear the sound of the trumpets, followed by the playing of oboes, lyres, zithers, harps, and then all the other instruments will join in. As soon as the music starts, you are to bow down and worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Anyone who does not bow down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. 
And so as soon as they heard the sound of the instruments, the people of all the nations, races, and languages bowed down and worshipped the gold statue which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Everything's according to Hoyle so far, right? There's no question about the fact that the idea that his kingdom would later be replaced by others was an annoyance to Nebuchadnezzar. <coughs> he wanted his descendants to rule forever. Was Nebuchadnezzar trying to set himself up as the ultimate king, or was he trying to claim to be a deity? What do you think? Well, Probably both. Yeah. In the beginning. Well, clearly Nebuchadnezzar was fully aware of the fact that Daniel and his three friends had excelled on their examinations at the end of their university course. He was also very aware of his dream and Daniel's interpretation as recorded in Daniel 2. Do we ever act like a little Nebuchadnezzar's? <laughs> Look at the world around us. Self-exaltation seems to be the theme song of almost everyone. Yeah. So what happens next? Look at the next few verses, starting with verse 8. It was then that some Babylonians took the opportunity to denounce the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May your majesty live forever. Your majesty has issued an order that as soon as the music starts, everyone is to bow down and worship the gold statue. And that anyone who does not bow down and worship his, it is to be thrown into the blazing furnace. There are some Jews whom you put in charge of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are disobeying your majesty's orders. They do not worship your God or bow down to the statue you set up. At that, the king flew into a rage and ordered the three men to be brought before him. He said to them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Is it true that you refuse to worship my God and to bow down to the gold statue I have set up? Now then, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets, oboes, lyres, zithers, harps, and all the other instruments, bow down and worship the statue. If you do not, you will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Do you think there is any God who can save you? Wow. How's that for a challenge? Well, um, is there anything else that sounds a little like that in the Bible? Well, Daniel in the lion's den. Okay, yeah. a little bit like that. Anything else that makes you think of this, those verses? In Revelation, the worship of the... Yeah. In Revelation 13, we have the devil demanding, well, it's through his two uh, associates, the, the uh, leopard-like beast and the lamb-like beast, demanding that people worship God and uh, worship them. And if they don't worship them, what's going to happen? You can't buy or sell, you're going to be killed. Very familiar. And what about Revelation 14, 9 to 11? Maybe I should read that one. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, whoever worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on their forehead or on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image, for anyone, has the, anyone who has the mark of its name. Okay? I think that's the message we're supposed to be taking to the world, right? Does it sound a little bit like Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah. Incorrectly and superficially understood, it sounds a lot like yeah, Nebuchadnezzar. It does. So try to imagine yourself on the plain of Dura. The name Dura means walled place in Akkadian. We don't know if there was actually a wall around the whole area or not. We don't know. Remember that the furnace in front was a kind of altar. Seven types of musical instruments were listed. The number seven is intended to invoke completeness and effectiveness. This whole scene was set up like a place of worship. How often today are we encouraged to adopt, adopt new lifestyles and new ideologies and to abandon the commitment we have to the authority of God and His Word? That happens all the time. Do you think we actually live in the last days of this earth's history? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think so. Well, the Babylonians used a hexadecimal number system, not a decimal system. 
like the Egyptians and we do. Thus, their numbers focused on the number six instead of ten. So there are six categories of people in this story. The number of the beast in Revelation 13 is 666. The statute was 60 cubits high and six cubits wide. What is that implying? Did bowing down to that idol on the plain of Dura really mean, I'm sorry, my computer is misbehaving here, really mean anything? What does worship mean? To worship someone or something means to regard that person or that thing as of great value. So what is regarded as of great value to us in our day? Is it houses, land, cars, retirement plans, fame? Do we have any of that kind of problem in our day? Oh, yeah. 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 Ongoing. All the time. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So Nebuchadnezzar was demanding that everyone bow down to his idol. The three Hebrew young men knew about Exodus 23 to 6, where it says you must not bow down to any of those things, and Deuteronomy 6, 4, which says God only is Lord. It was stated that anyone not bowing down to the image would be thrown into the blazing furnace. Many people are not aware that Nebuchadnezzar on other occasions had literally uh, burned people who did not follow his will. Look at Jeremiah 29, 21 and 22. Dennis, I think that's yours. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, has spoken about Ahab, son of uh, Koliah and Zedekiah, son of Maasai, who were telling the lies in his name. He has said that he will hand them over to the power of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia, who will put them to death before your eyes. When the people who are taken away as prisoners from Jerusalem to Babylonia want to bring a curse on someone, they will say, May the Lord treat you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylonia roasted alive. Wow. Is that the way Ahab died? Not the king Ahab. This is another Somebody Ahab. Somebody else. else. Yeah. yeah. Is that, when I read no, that, I thought, the Ahab. king Ahab died with that arrow that was that they didn't even know who he was, and the arrow flew through the yeah, he died in, in, battle. in a battle. While the Babylonian gods and the gods of other ancient nations surrounding Israel did not demand exclusive worship, the God of the Hebrews did. Notice these words from a couple different translations. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Exodus 25, and that, of course, is the King James Version. Many of you probably memorized. Or my Good News Bible says, I am the Lord your God, and I tolerate no rivals. That should be pretty clear, right? Look at Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. We just mentioned Israel. Remember this, the Lord and the Lord alone is our God. Is he saying, well, it's all right to have two or three others? No. So do we just worship a picky God? No. Picky you implies a negative say. idea that somebody <laughs> is... Uh, being overly, uh, I can't think of the word, but anyway, overly something, you know what I mean. Yeah. Sensitive. Anyway, sensitive or whatever, but it has more to do with the fact that he's the source of life, and so if we turn away from him, uh, we remain dead. He offers us life. We are born in our sin. We're uh, dead on our trespasses. If we turn away from God, we are the ones that lose. Yeah, he's right. our creator. Yeah. There is no other yeah. source of life. I think it shows that he is um, a God of love, actually. Mm -hmm. Because when you want your sweet pea, mm -hmm. you don't want to share your sweet pea with other. That's right. You want your sweet pea to yourself. And some would say that's jealousy or that's this or that. But Real love is, mm -hmm. I don't know, there's, there's just a special bond there. So I, I think it shows that our God loves mm -hmm. us. Yeah. And he knows what's best for us. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The requirement well, is you got to listen. Yes. If you don't want to listen, he's not going <laughs> to pester you. Yep. <gasps> Imagine the people who reported on these three young men. You see those guys? They didn't bow down. Mm -hmm. And remember, these guys were the ones that he put in charge of Babylonia. We're going to take care of them. Yeah. 
Now you kind of wonder about how long they've been placed in those important positions. Yeah. If this is about 10 years after they arrive, they're in their late 20s. Yep. And uh, I'm reminded of reading this book by Jacques on Secrets of Daniel. He mentions the text in Isaiah 45, 2-3, yeah. where it says, I'll be with you when you walk through the fire. And you have to say, that's only 120 or so years. Maybe they memorized that. They said, yep. we can handle anything. Psalms 23. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or go through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. So the way these people reported to the king was intentionally designed to inflame his passions. They reminded him that he himself had set up the statue and that he was the one who had placed these three young men over the province of Babylon. More than that, these young men had refused to worship the gods that he wanted to promote. And now they had refused to worship the image the king had set up. Clearly, Nebuchadnezzar was furious. He said, Who is that God you shall, God that shall deliver you from my hands? Daniel 3.15. How do you feel about the response of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? So these are their words. I mean, you're speaking to the most powerful man in the, in the world at that point in time who has the right to just speak a word and you're, 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 you're finished, you're dead. So how do they respond? Okay, this is from Daniel 3, 17 to 18. And this says, If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. This is from the New King James Version. Wow. So where did that commitment to God and that faith come from? Romans ten seventeen. So then faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through preaching Christ from the Good News Bible. So a trusting relationship with God can only come from learning about Him and becoming His friend. In John fifteen fifteen, Jesus said, I do not call you servants any longer, because servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends, because I have told you everything I have heard from my Father. But really that word, is ser this servants, is really slave. Yeah. It's, it's really the... God says, I don't want slaves anymore. Right. I he want friends. friends. Yep. Well, how do you feel about the statement, God wants love and friends, but the devil wants obedience and slaves? Can you believe that the devil would actually ask Jesus to bow down and worship him? I've always thought that was really pretty odd. <laughs> you know, it's insane. In the wilderness, I mean, Lucifer knew Jesus before he was Jesus in the heavenly kingdom. Yep. Does that remind you of Nebuchadnezzar in some respects? Yeah, it does. Well, God, we choose to serve God and to love God, and he only wants our love mm -hmm. freely given. That's our choice. The devil tries to force you to worship him. Tries, he, he uses force. So think about it for a moment. Would you want to be friendly with Nebuchadnezzar at this point in time? Probably not. Not if you want to worship the true God, right? Right. What about the third angel message in Revelation 14, 9 through 11? We just read it a few moments ago. Does that sound like a friendly God? Misunderstood, it sounds like a terrible God. That, those verses are the verses that are used by many, many people to support the idea of eternally burning hell. Hmm. Because they misunderstand them, they misread them. As a church, we have claimed that the three angels' messages is our end-time message for the world. Is our God nothing more than a heavenly Nebuchadnezzar? And then we think Ellen White. She said, the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. Whoa. Does God say to the wicked at the end, worship me or into the burning fiery furnace? Saying, follow me and, <clears throat> and you will live. Yeah. Otherwise, well, what about Revelation 14? What? You mean, isn't the that third what we're angel's message. About? Yeah. Doesn't sound like 
follow me and be I'll be loving and kind, it sounds like if you don't follow me, I'm going to throw you into burning fiery furnace. Well, it doesn't mean it doesn't necessarily mean that God's going to do it. it these are the things that are going to happen. Mm -hmm. Just because it says God, many times in the Bible it says God did this. I'm going to do this. No, it's not in there. Look at look at your interlinears. Yeah. The the pronoun is not there, but it's the presupposition, the per paradigm, the point of view on the part of the translator. Yeah. And the publishers, because the publishers want to sell books. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Bibles. Well, here's a couple of one-liners about hell that were seen on bumper stickers. See what you think. Frequent exposure to the sun, that's S-O-N, can prevent burning. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a good one. And what about this one? Welcome to eternity. Would you like smoking or non-smoking? Yeah, I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, how should we relate to the fact that there are large nations today with laws against changing religions? And what do we do? Good news seems to go better there than it yeah. does where. The, the more persecution there is, often this is the case, the more persecution there is, the better the gospel goes. Well, how many people, uh, what do we learn in this lesson that might be relevant to that question? How many people, how many other people in Babylon in those other national groups present there knew about their previous dream of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel and or the interpretation? Now, obviously, Nebuchadnezzar knew that's and the three young men do. What? Yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting to think about. You know, the word got around, though, it seems yes. like. Yes. Yeah. People being people, they're talking about what happened in court. And why is he building this statue? It's a, it's a change from, the, from yeah. the one he saw in vision. Yeah, I think he probably felt inspired to do that. Yeah. Maybe he thought the great God of the universe was wanting him to do that. Yeah. He can yeah. read all kinds of things into it. Would it be a in the next uh, lesson, we'll talk about what Babylon was like, and there are, there were a host of, I forget the numbers, but we'll come up upon them when we get there. Yeah. Uh, of temples and uh, and yep. uh, prominent places w like. Would that. it be a form of worship to work sixty hours a week in order to purchase the latest gadgets or a new car or a new house that we could so that we can press our associates and our neighbors? Or does rigid, adher rigid adherence to principle seem like an old-fashioned value? Hmm. If you're doing anything to try to impress people, it doesn't seem like you're on the right track. Yeah. Adlai Stevenson, that many of us remember from years and years and years ago, once said that it's often easier to fight for one's principles than to live up to them. Does being rigidly uncompromising when it comes to principles make one more savable or a better neighbor in heaven? How about a better neighbor here? Yeah. If you're too rigid <laughs> well, yep. about things. God says that uh, I don't change and mm -hmm. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So consistency, uh, it's easier to trust somebody who's consistent than it is you know, looking the other direction uh, towards mm -hmm. God. Uh, it's more it's easier to trust somebody who's consistent than somebody who's capricious and you yeah. never know how they're going to what they're going to do so it all has to be flavored with love yeah right so next nebuchadnezzar lost his temper his face turned red with anger at Shadrach, meshach and abednego so he ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual is that possible evidently it is well I think okay. you know, <laughs> made it as hot as it could possibly be. Yeah. When you say sometime, that's the ultimate. It's yeah. They find evidences of furnaces all over that area because they were oh, yeah. used to make bricks and yes. bricks are what you made. Well, it's smelting okay. also. Yeah. yeah. And he commanded the strongest men in his army to tie the three men up and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up, fully dressed, shirts, robes, caps, and all, and threw them into the blazing furnace. Now, because the king had given strict orders for the furnace to be made extremely hot, the flames burnt up the guards who took the men to the furnace. Wow. That would be sad to be in that position. Every one of those family members yeah. why that happened. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, still tied up, fell into the heart of the blazing fire. 
Suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement. He asked his officials, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the blazing furnace? They answered, yes, we did, your majesty. Then why do I see four men walking about in the fire? He asked. They are not tied up and they show no sign of, of being hurt. And the fourth one looks like an angel. Now there's various ways to interpret that. Or a son of the gods or a son of God. Wow. Well, the Hebrew, I'm sorry, that, that's a passage I was going to ask Carrie to read there. You got the, next one. the Hebrew expression, son of God, means literally a divine being. But the Lord did not forget his own. And that, that's, uh, I'm sorry, that's yours, Jim. But the Lord did not forget his own. As his witnesses were cast into the furnace, the Savior revealed himself to them in person, and together they walked in the midst of the fire, in the presence of the Lord, of heat and cold, the flames lost their power to consume. Don't you kind of wonder how long they stood there in mouths wow. hanging open, watching that? How long did that happen? Yeah. Prophets and Kings, 508 to 509. So, the question we might ask ourselves, why does God act so dramatically in some stories like this one, and at other times seem to do nothing? Yeah, there's so many things in Psalms. He's saying, Lord, you're mm -hmm. not doing a thing. Mm -hmm. Help us, can't you see what's happening? How would you feel if you'd been an observer of this whole process? And what was God's role in this whole story? Think about it. Was he trying, the faith, was he trying to reward the faith of these three young friends? Was he trying to reach out to Nebuchadnezzar? Probably both. Oh, yeah. Using that as a way to reach him. Was he trying to say something of significance to the entire group looking on? Yes. I mm -hmm. think so. Yes. It was sure an opportunity. Yeah. Anyone that had been there that day would never forget that. Yeah. So what do you think they learned, the people looking on? Well, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God was greater than all in the a, other gods. in a whole different category huh mm. <laughs> a whole different category yes. and i you know wonder i i like to ask this question when those people got home that night what did they say to their families did you see what i saw today <laughs> did you hear what i saw <laughs> yeah I, I like to think of it in those terms yeah yeah wow is there evidence that any further attempts were made to worship this image no hint of that at all. Scripture doesn't give us anything. Mm -mm. How about tradition? No. Nope. Nope. Jewish tradition, nothing said about that? Well, you know what? We need to remember, of course, that all of us as sinners are looking for a rescue that is beyond belief and way more than the one in this story. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 15? I'm not going to read the whole thing, but... What happens if we're delivered from our condition of being sinful people to go to heaven? And what are we delivered from? Sin and death. Yeah. Wow. But when all things have been placed under Christ's rule, this is starting with verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 15, then he himself, the Son, will place himself under God who placed all things under him and God will rule completely over all. And so, there we go. That's the goal that God has in mind for all of us. So how many of your Christian beliefs are so important to you that you would die for them? I had a teacher in medical school, a religion teacher in medical school that used to ask the question, okay, how many of the beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church would you be willing to die for? That's a thought. Or would you find some way to rationalize in order to save your life? Yeah, you might say, I can do more good if I live than if I die at this point. That's what some people would say, probably. Well, uh, don't you think it's just basically, I mean, everything that the Seventh-day Adventist Church believes is not necessarily um, you give your life for. I mean, the Sabbath, yes. But whether or not you eat pork or not, I mean, if you're starving, you'd eat anything. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, there are just some things that are more important than others. Yeah. yeah it depends a lot on the circumstances. You so. might be in a place where you need to do that because you could really witness to a whole lot of people. Yeah. It's called but situation think, ethics, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but don't you think a lot of times that <coughs> people might make it into some sort of a thing that a martyr complex, if I die, then I'm important? Well, if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had done that, they would have missed a great opportunity to witness. Mm -hmm. yeah, see, God used that in that circumstance. Yep. That was a, an amazing thing to happen. When so the question we have to face is, you know, the time is coming mm -hmm. yeah. when persecution will be worse than it's been ever in the past. Well, Hebrews 11 is known as what? Faith the faith chapter. But if you notice carefully, if you read through it carefully, it's really about what faith does and not about what faith is. It doesn't define faith. So I'd like to propose an answer. This is something put together uh, by my friend, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell. After studying, we discussed this in class several times. Based on all of Scripture, a biblical definition of faith stated so well, so many times by one of God's best modern friends, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell, is as follows. Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. Different languages, there are different words for faith. The better we know him, the better that relationship may be. We can't say will be because we have to remember the story of Lucifer in heaven. Faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based on the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe what he says as soon as we are sure he, he is the one saying it, to accept what he offers as soon as we are sure he is the one offering it, and to do what he wishes as soon as we are sure he is the one wishing it without reservation for the rest of eternity. Now that's quite a commitment. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for salvation. So why do we say faith is the only requirement for salvation? All you biblical scholars? Well, it's a, our attitude toward God. Our attitude of love toward God. Yes. If, if you look at a Hebrew-English uh, lexicon, mm -hmm. uh, Persuasion is the first uh, definition. And how does God communicate? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. God uses words to communicate, mm -hmm. to ultimately persuade you to make a decision for or against yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a pro it's a process, but it's not a something that something's planted inside you with a, or with a syringe or however. Well, the verse that we need to remember is found in Acts 16, verse 31, and it's on my screen here. They answered, and now this is, remember the story, Paul and, and Silas are in prison. They're singing because they can't sleep. It was completely impossible. They've been beaten and all that other kind of stuff. And suddenly there's that earthquake that sets them free, and the jailer thinks that the, his prisoners have escaped. He's ready to kill himself. And they say, don't, 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 we're all here. And he says, really? Why? And they answered, believe or have faith in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. Yeah. Believe and you will be saved. Have faith, you will be saved. So faith really is the only requirement for salvation. That's what Paul said. Faith also means, and here's a huge difference between the way some different people take, approach faith, Faith also means that like Abraham, Genesis 18, 22 and 33, Job, Job 42, 7 and 8, and Moses, Exodus 32, 5 to 14, and Numbers 14, 11 to 25, God's friends, they were well known as God's friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. God does not expect us to just, you know, stand there like dumbos and say, yeah, anything you say. God expects us to think, and to ask questions. Come now, let us reason. Yep. 
Some people have a quantitative view of faith. If they pray for some immediate need and God answers their prayers by meeting that need, they feel that their faith is enhanced. But what happens if God chooses not to reward their request right at that moment? Does that destroy their faith? For some people it does. Well, I would suggest that God is much more concerned about the quality of our faith, not the quantity, the quality, and that he is about the quantity. Uh, then he is about the quantity, I'm sorry. Um, Jackie? Important are the lessons, wait, this is Ellen G. White, Prophets and Kings. Important are the lessons to be learned from the experience of the Hebrew youth on the plain of Dura. In this our day, many of God's servants, though innocent of wrongdoing, will be given over to suffer humiliation and abuse at the hands of those who, inspired by Satan, are filled with envy and religious bigotry. Especially will the wrath of man be aroused against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, and at last a universal decree will denounce these as deserving death. The season of distress before God's people will call for a faith that will not falter. His children must make it manifest that he is the only object of their worship and that no consideration, not even that of life itself, can induce them to make the least concession to false worship. Now that, could that happen in our day? But what kind of things could be involved in false worship in our day? Is that possible? Well, a lot of music things are you could use well, that as an example. Look around you in the lives of people that you know and ask yourself what is the most important thing in their life? And how many of those people are the worship of God is the most important thing in their Can life. Can addictions be worship? Oh, yes. Because I, I find uh, our society is worship, worships the stomach, yeah. the taste buds, the uh, food for pleasure rather than to live. And, and then the second thing I see are young people just being consumed by electronic devices. So, what does it say there in Philippians? Your God is your belly? Mm-hmm. No, your, your God, yeah, your God is the belly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Philippians 3, 19. Yep, <laughs> yep. Material things also, and, yeah. and also so, uh, pride, and uh, you can worship yourself. Well, the other way that's put is, do you eat to live, or do you live to eat? I mean, Think about the, yeah. the idea. Well, and the old gods, many of them, um, it wasn't just sacrificing their children, which, but um, it was lust, mm -hmm. sex, mm -hmm. and of course Hollywood and the way everything is presented. That's how they sell everything. Yeah, they want to sell you a T-shirt, and it's mm -hmm. they use sex to do it. So uh, there's a lot of idolatry. Actually. Okay, Jackie, sorry for interrupting there. You can go on. To the loyal heart, the commands of sinful, finite men will sink into insignificance beside the word of the eternal God. Truth will be obeyed, though the result be imprisonment or exile or death. Wow. That's Prophets of Kings, as you mentioned, 512 to 513. Look at 1 Peter 3, uh, 3 through 9. Let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he gave us new life by raising Jesus Christ from death. This fills us with a living hope. <coughs> and so we look forward to possessing the rich blessings that God keeps for his people. He keeps them for you in heaven where they cannot decay or spoil or fade away. Remember, said, Jesus says, put your riches in heaven where neither moth nor rust does corrupt. They are for you who through faith are kept safe by God's power for the salvation which is ready to be revealed at the end of time. Be glad about this, even though it may now be, it may now be necessary for you to be sad for a little while because of the many kinds of trials you suffer. The pur their purpose is to prove that your faith is genuine, 
even gold which can be destroyed is tested by fire and so your faith which is much more precious than gold must also be tested so that it may endure then you will receive praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed your love for him you, you love him i'm sorry although you have not seen him and you believe in him although you do not do not now see him so you rejoice with a great and glorious joy which words cannot express because you are receiving the salvation of your souls which is the purpose of your faith in him wow so why do you think god rescued some people and not others is there anything any way to determine before we get to the kingdom of heaven why re god rescues some and allows others to die think of john the baptist and then think about the three young men we've just been talking about opposite results think of daniel in the lion's den and then peter and paul that were beheaded or crucified upside down the apostle john versus job's children and job himself a lot of questions could be raised right well but isn't a great comfort really to those who love god to know that john the baptist i mean yeah i mean if you were being uh under trials and tribulations and in jail and imprisoned and all of that knowing that jesus cousin yeah. lost his head yeah for his faith and died younger than jesus probably yeah yeah well, what do you got? Uh, the Apostle Paul and Peter, yeah. and uh, of course Jesus and John the Baptist. I mean, I mean, it's a it's a comfort to those that are suffering. I think that should be. Yeah. Well, now here's a question: If this story had ended with the death of the Hebrew men in this fiery furnace, what lessons could we still take away? I think the lessons of the people on the plain at Dura, which was about three and a half miles south of Babylon, right next to the river Dura, goes into the Euphrates. Mm -hmm. I think if they would have saw that happen, they'd say, boy, we've got to serve the king from fear. Look what happened to them. Yeah. yeah. God's faithful children were loyal to God even despite troubles. <laughs> they had already been taken from their homes as slaves and forced to walk from Jerusalem to Babylon. But what a demonstration of the power of the God <coughs> they served that they could never forget to see those guys walk out unburned, unsinged, not their hair or anything. Not even the smell of smoke. Of yeah. And get interviewed by Nebuchadnezzar and his officials. I, don't, I just think it had to be yeah. phenomenal. They must had have to be told for generations afterward. Yeah. They must have just felt them all over their clothes Yeah, exactly. And do you I think, can't believe what I'm looking at. Oh, I can't I believe what I'm seeing. <laughs> yeah, would you would you be afraid to touch them at first? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think they were gods. <laughs> wow. Well, we're told that in the final events of this world's history, Sabbath worship will be the outward sign of a belief in God and a trust in His Word above and beyond our trust in any worldly entity. So why is the observance of the Sabbath so important? Is this just God saying, you have to do it my way or else? It's, or is it that, go ahead. It's a weekly reminder that God is God and we are not. We are not. I like that. So, is it that it represents an entire paradigm, which is what you're suggesting? A whole, a whole set of beliefs, a whole set of ideas that go together, including our trust in God's word. Mm-hmm. So I was to say, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Yeah. You, there's a one a interlinear you can look at. The Sab remember the Sabbath day for keeping holy of him. In other words, the pur purpose of the Sabbath is an opportunity to educate yourself about the the infinite one mm -hmm. and uh, help you uh, make a make a choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's for our benefit not because of, uh, as a demonstration to others that... Uh, well, well let, let me put a, a proposal to you out there and I'll put, put it to us here. God seems to respond quite remarkably at times when he is directly challenged. Let's look at a couple of examples. Look at Exodus 12, verse 12. On that night, here's a, at the end of the plagues in Egypt, 
On that night, I, this is God speaking, I will go through the land of Egypt, killing every firstborn male, both human and animal, and punishing all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. So what was going on there? They were trying to think of every possible thing they could think of to, you know, no, we worship this God, okay, it's a plague. We worship this God, turn it into a plague. We worship this God, turn it into a plague. This was a direct confrontation. And look at 1 Kings 18. You know the story, I won't go into all the details, but this is the story of Elijah, where there was a, there was a famine, for there was no rain for three and a half years, and they come up to Mount Carmel, and then there's the, the prophets of Baal and, and Ashtoreth are trying to get the fire to go, and then, lo and behold, we have Elijah standing there by himself, and there's this incredible... See, that's, that's a direct challenge to yeah, God. Yeah, exactly. So when God is directly challenged, do you think that might happen at the end? Will there be times when God is directly challenged? When they paint on the, or where they, when they, the signs on the side of the buses in London say, in, as Christmas season is coming up, this happened a couple years ago, there is no God to so go home and enjoy yourself. That really happened? Yeah, absolutely, oh yeah. Who sponsored that, I wonder? Um, Tim Daw what's his name? Dawkins? Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins, the atheist. Huh. He paid for that to be done. Oh, wow. Boy, someday he's going to have a turnabout face. So when Satan directly challenges God or God's people, God often acts and proves who is the real God. Do we learn anything of significance about God or about the great controversy in this story? Or is this just a power struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil? What would you think was the collective impact of this story in Nebuchadnezzar's day? How many, how many people, do you think all the people out on the plan, plane there were able to see or observe, at least get some idea about what was happening in the fiery furnace? They obviously couldn't all go crowding in, but... Oh, it had to be passed around. Yeah. Something like oh, that yeah. would be passed on and through the generations, I would think. And probably he had this furnace, fiery furnace, on a very prominent place so that yep. people would see it. So they would walk by there and say, well, I'll, I'll go kneel down. I sure don't want to land in that yeah. fire. So it was probably in a very prominent place as well. Yep. Well, it seems that there are at least three major things that we need to learn from this lesson. One the truth, or maybe we should, the, should say the truths about worship, two, faithfulness and deliverance. What do you think these three young men had to say to each other when they were alone and able to talk freely? Well, I bet they talked about that the rest of their lives. Yep. That would be probably what do you think Jesus might have said to them when they were in that fiery furnace? Have to ask them someday. If you face a very difficult situation and you see that God's hand helps you through it, how does that affect your faith? It strengthens it. Absolutely. When Nebuchadnezzar insisted that all the government leaders at almost every level come to the plain of Dura and bow down to this idol, was he thinking more of politics or religion? Well, in ancient times, there was often a blurring of the line between the two. Where was Daniel during these proceedings? Was he back taking care of things in Babylon? We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Maybe he was left in charge when Nebuchadnezzar yeah. went down to the plain of Dura. Did Nebuchadnezzar, realizing how he would respond, assign him other duties? I mean, you know, look what, he's been through two things already, right? Did the other three young men recognize that this image was a direct challenge to Daniel's dream and interpretation? I mean, was it obvious to even the people on the plane there that, okay, we know about that other image, and here's Babylon, I mean, here's Nebuchadnezzar's challenge to that. Did they recognize that? Or did they think this was just an attempt by Nebuchadnezzar to set up some kind of new worship? It probably went right over their heads, most of them. Yeah, I think so. Is it possible that Nebuchadnezzar set this idol up directly to challenge the ideas that he'd been faced with 
by Daniel and his three friends? Yes. Is it even possible that Nebuchadnezzar remembered back to the time when he bowed down to Daniel and he thought, I must not call Daniel to be present because how foolish I would look calling all these people to worship my image and then I end up bowing down to Daniel himself again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, there might have been some serious possibilities there. You know? As Nebuchadnezzar looked back on that previous experience, did he think of it as a terrible political and social blunder? Did he ask himself, what was I doing bowing down to Daniel? Mm. Well, shouldn't the three Hebrews have found some excuse to avoid going to the plain of Dura? Didn't they know what would happen when they got there? With the thousands of people out there on that plain, is it possible that there was not another Hebrew person there? What about King Zedekiah? If he was there, did he bow down? Did any other Hebrews refuse to bow down? Do you think Nebuchadnezzar was specifically trying to test these other three young men from Judea apart from their champion Daniel? Or is it possible that he had overlooked them since they were not in direct contact with him on a daily basis? Well, um, the, go ahead. Well, it was just that the people that turned him in were jealous of mm -hmm. those three yeah. specific <clears throat> young men. How many other of those people who bowed down out there were saying in their minds, okay, we'll bow down, but you know we don't believe in it? Would that be okay? They would. They lost a great chance to witness. Yeah. That uh, the three Hebrews took. There must have been a lot more Hebrews than just three. Yeah. I mean, he had uh, leaders, diplomats, everyone. Dennis, I think you have some words on that. Yeah, this is um, quoted in the Adult Teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide on uh, 54 to 55, and it's from Daniel uh, Peter by Peter Stevenson. So, one point, and this is, we've kind of touched on this, but one point that deserves a comment is the conspicuous absence of Daniel. Christian commentators in the Talmud have advanced several hypotheses as to the reason for his absence. One, Daniel was away on business. Two, he had permission from the king to withdraw. Three, he stood so high with Nebuchadnezzar that no one dared to complain about him. <laughs> That's an interesting point. For his four, his presence may not have been required. Five, he may have been sick. Six, Daniel was no longer involved in government. Seven, not likely. That, no. That's, that's not likely because mm -hmm. he's still yeah. there long after that. Yeah. Time. Seven, Daniel was present and he briefly bowed before the image, but the Lord does not let his name occur here because of his later faithfulness. I not likely. No. I don't think of mm -mm. that one. Mm -mm. Eight, God kept Daniel away so that people would not say, that they were delivered uh, through his merit. That the three young men were delivered because Daniel saved them, okay? Right. Eight, Daniel avoided the scene to keep from fulfilling the prophecy that the graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire, Deuteronomy 7.25. And 10, Nebuchadnezzar let Daniel depart, lest people say he was burnt. He, did I? Oh, yeah, it repeats. Uh, lest people say he has burnt his God in fire. This summary is from Peter Stevenson, Daniel. Well, Daniel was still there at the Medo Persian mm. Empire. Yes. So there's no possibility yeah. that he wasn't involved no. anymore. No. He was sort of the prime minister for several years. Even back into the, into the days of Medo Persia. Truthfully, we do not know why Daniel was not there or is not mentioned. As you can see, a number of suggestions have been made. Can you think of other examples in the Bible that are similar in some ways to this story, the three, three Hebrew worthies? What about the confrontation between Mordecai and Haman? Oh, yeah. yeah. In the book of Esther. And what did Satan try to accomplish by that trick? Try to wipe out they the... Just try to, yeah, just try the Jews. Destroy the whole bunch of them. Holocaust. That's about, that's about 120 years, I think, later. Mm -hmm. Esther's time. Do we have it so easy in our day and in our country that we do not really know what it means to stand up for God? 
of course we're talking about the United States, but other places in the world might be similar. Ask yourself these questions, and Margaret, I think you have some there. Okay, what are some of the things that now, today, we are tempted to worship? In what ways are we, even as Christians, slowly but surely getting caught up in worshiping something other than God? Where do you draw the line between unswerving commitment to the Lord and fanaticism? When it comes to your relationship with those who still do not know the Lord, is there a place for compromise? If so, in what way and under what circumstances? What things, if any, can we or should we compromise? How can we tell if we are compromising or simply being prudent? <laughs> Would you jeopardize your life for, you, for refusing to do a very simple act? If not, why couldn't you conform outwardly while inwardly feeling moral reservations? Which is better, to die for truth or to avoid crisis and live to continue or wit our witness? So that's, that's explain. A yeah. That's a great that's question. A great yeah, question. which is what better, to die for truth or, or to live to or live on? Or yeah. avoid maybe. the crisis and live. That's just from the teacher's Sabbath school, adult teacher's Sabbath yeah. school Bible study guide. But that situation well, may, may be your greatest opportunity to witness. Yeah. yeah. You're just kicking the can down the road. Well, and, and you know, and you're asking yourself, do I witness by possibly sacrificing my life here? Or do I witness more by somehow getting out of this situation so I can go on witnessing later? And I, I am sure that there's going to be a lot of people are going to be faced with that kind of a challenge. There, there are people being faced with that kind of a challenge right today uh, in some parts of the world. And it's, uh, I mean, you know, if you, we, 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 I traveled to Turkey a while back, and our guide was a guy that I think was favoring Christianity, but he, of course, was officially a Muslim. And I asked him, how, how do you become a Muslim in this country? He says, when you're, bur when you're born, they stamp on your birth certificate. Muslim. That's it. And he <laughs> said, he said, you do not have a chance to change. It's against the law to change your religion. Hmm. So what do you do under those kind of circumstances? Just incredible. Well, we're going to throw a whole lot of questions out there to you because you're going to have to think for yourself. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of studying your word, of thinking about these experiences and thinking how someday they might happen again, that we might be involved. Help us to have the courage to stand for the truth in the best way possible with the guidance of your Holy Spirit is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.